Hello and welcome to Heritage Matters. I'm Nini Men and today we have a very, very special discussion lined up for you from Srinagar and Delhi and we are putting the spotlight on Kashmir and its fabulous history and how little we know of it. Uh, the two things that Kashmir is famous for is its beauty and its conflict and the terrible pain that you see and hear about from the valley. But uh, really there is another side to Kashmir and that's largely forgotten and because it's forgotten, it is in a pretty bad state. We, I have uh, three very interesting guests with me from Srinagar. I have Dr. Salim Bey, uh, the former Director General of the Tourism Department of uh, Jammu Kashmir, also the man who brought conservation and heritage management into Kashmir by setting up the first intact unit over there. I have Dr. Ajmal Shah, an expert on prehistoric uh, uh, period, especially in Kashmir. He's also excavated some of the biggest sites across India as an archaeologist. And I have Prashant Mathavan, a very popular columnist on Live History India. He's written extensively for us from the far corners of Kashmir. He's traveled extensively there. And one person I'm very jealous of because he gets to go to the most amazing places and chronicle the stories. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. You know, um, Ajmal, I want to start with you because Part of heritage matters is also knowing about the heritage. And I don't think many people know about the amazing heritage that Kashmir sits on, you know, the geological heritage, the fact that thousands of years ago, the Kashmir Valley was a lake. Some of the earliest Neolithic sites are in the Kashmir Valley. It's just mind blowing. So I want to ask you to quickly take us through, you know, how the story of Kashmir started. And as an archeologist, uh, what an amazing array of sites you have to excavate and discover. Take us to one or two of the great sites. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here in your show. And in fact, yes, heritage matters. So we must discuss on what's going on, what's the real condition and scenario of the heritage in Jammu and Kashmir. So thank you very much for uh, having me here again. So first and foremost, uh, when you say about the uh, ancient past of Kashmir, so we go back to probably millions of years, if you talk about the geological past and all that, when the Kashmir was, you know, a huge lake. And incidentally, this has been recorded in the, uh, you know, uh, ancient literature of Kashmir, particularly Nilmat Puran, and then Kalhans Raj Tarangani, and many other, you know, uh, literary works, which were, you know, compiled by the people in from ancient times in Kashmir. And in fact, uh, Kashmir was known for its literary, you know, uh, sense it had, the historical uh, sense it had in, from the ancient past. So the story goes like, you know, uh, Kashmir was a huge lake and then, you know, uh, there it, it was known as Satisar, then Kashyapa came and he broke the la lake and killed the demon and then the water gushed out from the valley. And then this story has uh, its own version from different, uh, you know, uh, uh, from different religious books of the different faiths. So when you go into the Buddhist uh, version of it, so Buddhists try to, uh, Buddhist uh, uh, texts try to uh, see it from their own perspective. The Hindu texts try to see their, uh, this story, whole story uh, from the, its own perspective. And it was quite, you know, uh, it's really interesting to see that the Persian chroniclers, later Persian chroniclers in 14th, 15th century have put this similar story in their own context. Mm -hmm. So this has got so many versions and so many, you know, uh, chroniclers have you know, actually put it into the perspective. But what is very interesting is that this whole story of the, uh, whatever you call it, a mythological folklore or whatever uh, construction of the, you know, ancient beliefs and all that, uh, so this whole story has got its, you know, uh, imprints in the geological past of Kashmir as well. You have a huge number of, you know, uh, evidences where you can see, where you can confirm from the scientific uh, point of view that this particular land has been once eons ago, it has been a great huge lake. So the people have been coming uh, to the Kashmir Valley after it's, the desiccation started. Uh, the water started to desiccate from the valley. The hill was broken somewhere from Baramula. And then it was because of the tectonic moments, in fact, 
the scientific evidence proves it otherwise, but it's actually in, in you know, uh, relation with the literary sources, whatever literary sources says us. So the tectonic movement was so, uh, you know, vehemently and, uh, you know, uh, continuously uh, happening in Kashmir Valley that this phenomena has occurred at least three, four times in Kashmir, in Kashmir context. Particularly, the Kashmir was, you know, drained off, and again, tectonic movement started, and again, it was filled up. So, the a lot of scientific research has been done on that basis. So, the last desiccation, some people believe, is about eighty-five thousand years before present, when the lay, lay completely started draining out. So, the the land emerged from somewhere, and the lacustrine deposits started to build up the karivas, which we call the wooders in Kashmir. These karivas started, and this kariva, these karivas became the places where people started their own hamlets, their own settlements. So to to you know to do agriculture, to stay there, and for a quite long period of, period of time, it uh, continued to be so. So the first archaeological evidence, if we talk about, is you know uh, right from we uh, you know we can start with is around 40 to 60,000 years before present from Galandar site of the Pampur area. So accidentally, it was, a, it, was, it was basically an accidental discovery done by some people, uh, basically a geologist from um, uh, government degree college in Sopor. Right. So when this discovery happened in the year 2000, nobody knew that this would in fact give a one of the earliest evidences of the human occupation of the valley. How many people doesn't know still now, but it is still not published. And I believe, what I believe is whenever it is published that there will be a new emerging evidence coming up. So the, uh, with the elephant skull, which was discovered in the year 2000, the, there were some uh, 58 stone tools also discovered. So yeah, because the people who discovered these stone tools were not archaeologists, so they, they just collected it and left it aside. So the layers that we don't know on, because I was going to start the conversation on Burza home, which I know that you worked on, but this goes even further back. I'm going to come back to you, Dr. Shah, to yes. talk about this because, you know, Kashmir is strategically also very important, uh, uh, not only geologically, it was also the bridge between the mainland and the north and there's been such a lot of movement, and I know you've done a lot of work on the Central Asian movements, but uh, Big Sab, if I can come in uh, over here and bring you in. You know, uh, Ajmal has only talked about one small window of Kashmir's heritage, and there is so much to it. And what amazes me is that, you know, uh, such a lot of the legacy of Kashmir is still unknown outside a small group of historians, archaeologists, geologists, most people who go to Kashmir go to see uh, the natural beauty of Kashmir. Uh, why is it that we don't know so much about the historical uh, Kashmir? And uh, you know, our audience would be very surprised to know that there isn't a archaeological survey of India person in Srinagar, uh, which I find amazing because there are almost 69 monuments over there which are actually listed by the ASI. So, Big Sab, I want you to help us understand what the situation is. Well, this is a completely recent phenomenon, but as Ajmal was saying, as you mentioned, that we have a recorded history of, they say, 5,000 years, but some part goes into mythology, but most of it is prehistoric and proto-historic. And this was known to scholarly fraternity. All over the world, the world meant colonial world and the states. And as was I mentioned before we started the discussion, when Archival Survey of India was established in 1870, in 1871, the first director general, Mr. Cunningham, comes to Kashmir and prepares a report. He calls the report Historic Geography of Kashmir, which mm -hmm. is substantial, covering many things. Now we are confining it to archaeology. He also thought there's geography to this archaeology, which is true. There is geography to this archaeology. And in 1902, when State started discussing setting up of an office of Department of Archaeology. In 1904, they set up a directorate of archaeology in Jammu and Kashmir. Mm -hmm. And we had very illustrious people heading that department. The most illustrious being there, um, D.R. Sani, who's so well known in the archaeological world. We had Ramchandra Clark in the 30s. He had worked with John Marshall at 
Texila for five years. So some very brilliant minds were engaged in archaeology and a lot of work has been done. I wouldn't say work has not been done. But let me tell you, I have some understanding of how it has been going in the whole country because I worked with the National Organization, National Monument Authority for, the, for about for a 10 year. We are in good company, except for major monuments, which we know are not more than 100. How much do we know about the archaeological work, wealth of this country? We don't know much. We don't, we don't know much. We only know major, major monuments. India has so much to offer in terms of archaeology. It's mind-boggling. We also suffered, but our problem has been institutional as well. As I said, till 1955, we had a state department which was looking after their monuments. And let me mention this, that when state acceded to the, to the, to the dominion of India, Prime Minister comes here in 1949. That was his first almost civil visit. He brings along with him Director General Mr. Chakravarti. And Mr. Chakravarti prepares a list of monuments which should be taken over. There was a legal hitch. State government had not agreed to the National Act should be agreed to the request made by Agile Survey of India in 49 that National Act should be extended to Kashmir, which happened subsequently in 1956. That is when Agile Survey of India set up an office in Srinagar, which was upgraded five years later to a full-fledged circle and they, they named it Srinagar Circle. And let me tell you some good work. We had Mr. Professor Mani, B.R. Mani, they are Bish, Mr. Bish, they are Arasphonia, they are R.C. Agarwal, they, are, they did some monumental work and whatever little has finally been excavated is because of them. But I'll tell you a very unique thing. You mentioned about Burzama. There were two sites equally important, Burzama and Gufkra. Burzama was excavated, Mr. Khazanji and others came there. They worked in 60s. It was notified as an archival site of India, protected monument. Gufkra, Ajmal would perhaps know it better, has some certain features which perhaps take us much further than what we talked about, Burzama. A report was prepared in 1980, full-fledged archaeological report. They didn't notify it. As a result of that, as of today now, if you go to Burzama, to Gufkral, you find people have almost enclosed on the whole site. I saw a megalith which has been converted by a security force company into a Pir Baba. Because they think it's a huge stone, so we must. There must be some sacredness about that megalith. The only thing is that it was standing there, put it vertically on the ground, horizontally on the ground. So the whole problem is institutional. We have somehow, during the course of time, lost the priority which archaeology should have got here. The other reason is that not everything is covered. Mughal gardens are historic gardens. This is an established fact. In fact, even in, within our country, all, almost all Mughal gardens, surviving Mughal gardens, are archaeological properties. Except in case of Kashmir, our Mughal gardens are public park. They are the Department of Floriculture who are more interested in floriculture part of the work. And in, in, interestingly, when I refer to 49 visit of Mr. Chakravarti, the list had at serial number one Mughal gardens for notifying as national monuments. We didn't happen for some reason. The result has been that it has been a long struggle in, since 2004. I in tourism department and subsequently in intact. We tried to do something in terms of restoration of the gardens and we finally were able to get it on the tentative list of the World Heritage Sites in 2012. The whole situation is <clears throat> such that we don't know where to start now. I'll, we have been talking about archaeology, we have been talking about history. I think in the second round, we should also talk about the unprotected heritage. And we have so much of unprotected heritage in the state. Absolutely. It's unbelievable. Even the one that is supposedly protected, sir, is in such a bad state. I mean, we yeah. had done a story on Burza home, and we had spoken to both you and Ajmal about the situation True. there. And it's amazing. I mean, the, the most famous Neolithic site of India, I, I, uh, I can call it that, is now a, a cricketing pitch. Cricket, with, uh, yeah, it is T20 or uh, something. Premier League. Premier League. The Burza yeah, Premier place League. is known I as Premier blame, League now. And I don't blame the kids who are doing that, uh, Mr. Vague, because they don't have a context of what that place is all about. And I want to come back to Burza home because that deserves a full discussion on its own. But let me get uh, Prashant in. Prashant, 
you know, you've done some fabulous stories for us, the Horsemen of Peer Punjab, the Harman Monastery, and I know Ajmal has done work on all of these places. But as you travel deep in, even at Parihaspura, which was the capital of the great Lalita Aditya, the great king uh, of, uh, of Kashmir in the 8th century, tell me, what do you see on the ground? Uh, you know, when you travel to these places, is it neglect? Is it apathy? Is it, uh, or is it the fact that because nobody knows if these places are well protected? <clears throat> uh, see, first thing I would like to mention that I was also born and brought up in Kashmir. So I never knew about the Harvan Monastery. I never knew about Parihaspura. Of course, I knew about uh, some of the, of course, Mughal Gardens, everybody knew, and uh, some of the more famous monuments, everybody knows, some of the more famous temples. I never went to Naranag also because I never knew about Naranag also. And uh, so it's not just people from outside. We were, I was, I till class 10th, I was in, I was studied in Srinagar. We, we were not, never taught about these things, you know. We were never, we never knew that these places existed. So when we talk about uh, letting uh, tourists from outside know, first, if people who are living in the state who, who, who own this heritage, even they don't know about it. So uh, people from outside are, are a second priority, you know, only when you educate your own people with people from outside, uh, they would spread the word that, okay, there is this place also, and there is this place also. I'm talking from a tourist uh, perspective as somebody who's an amateur who's interested in history, who likes to go and visit historical places. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a mixture of government apathy. And uh, of course, when like 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 you say, the kids are playing cricket there. They don't know the, about the significance of the place. They just see it as a playing ground where they can play cricket. You know, somebody has to you, somebody has to tell you the significance of a place for you to you know give it uh, the sanctity it deserves, and then you will probably stay away from it. You know, but uh, that that runs through. That's a general Indian phenomenon as uh, Beg Sab also mentioned. It's not something which is particular to Kashmir. History has never been our history is more about this person fighting this person. It's never been about uh, uh, the heritage or the archaeology. Our archaeology, what we study in history, is, uh, uh, is, is is just limited to the Indus Valley civilization and Harappa. That's when somebody says archaeology, we think about Indus Valley civilization and Harappa. Nothing beyond that, and nothing after that. Right, right. Completely agree, and I think this is a national apathy. In fact, on this show, I've been pretty much in every episode saying that the only thing that unites this country across political ideology, across everything is our apathy towards our history and heritage, which is really sad. But actually, when I'm going to come to you, I find it fascinating that there is a cultural memory of something like a great lake, which has come down in text. And that as an archaeologist is a very fascinating thing that you actually correlate what is there with <laughs> the kind of text and textual reference. Uh, you know, uh, so isn't it that the link has completely broken up. What accounts for that breaking up of the link? Because I want to come to some of the other sites over there, the great Buddhist legacy of uh, Kashmir, the great, uh, you know, syncretic culture that Kashmir has always stood for. Somewhere, the conversation on Kashmir is always black and white, black and white, black and white. What has happened to this cultural memory? In in, in fact, what, what has happened to that, that it's, it's a lack of the apathy of the department and the not to be continued research in the field has not seen uh, from at least from uh, last three decades what happened in Kashmir. I'll give you one example that this particular thing happened when uh, Kanispur was excavated by Dr. B. R. Mani, who was the then superintendent of, uh, superintendent of the archaeology of the ESI circle in Kashmir. And it was in 1998-99, I guess. Yeah, 1998-99. And then after that, till now, till we excavated in 2017, not even a single site was excavated, explored in Kashmir Valley. So the loss of that continuity, which happened before, uh, you know, uh, as uh, Salim Beg Saab uh, was saying that there were a couple of people who were very interested in archaeology of Kashmir, like Dr. Bia Mani, R.S. Bisht was there. Uh, T.N. Khazanchi, who excavated, you know, uh, Burzuhom and uh, R.S. Bisht, who excavated, you know, Gufkral. So many of these people who were the stalwarts in archaeology, who excavated, who continued the research in the field, which gave people a lot of material to think about. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the knowledge of these sites used to reach to the common people, basically, in good old days. 
but what happened now we are entering into the tech, uh, technological you know phase of our you know uh, generations but still this particular thing is missing you know when you go to the people you try to explain them that this has this thing has got this much of great past this particular site is very valuable to kashmir history archaeology identity culture but these people are rather you know uh, you know in case of Burzuhom also, we went many at times to the people that this, let, let's preserve this site. You you can get many many uh, you know uh, economic benefits when the site becomes you know the tourist spot. It will recognize it as a world heritage site or like that. So, but these people are reluctant to you know listen because the continuity of those things which were actually generated by the researchers earlier it has lost somewhere in between from last three decades, in fact. So the research in the field couldn't continue. The many other things which were supposed to do uh, by, by the department and the people at the helm of affairs, that did not happen. And people, you know, they discontinued actually. So the thing is like, you know, when you try to, you know, inspire people about your identity, about your culture, you know, when you try to aware them, that part has to be done by the by you know uh, taking you know huge research in the in that context sure. you know giving new facts to the people to think about their own identity i was earlier talking about to some things which which are which are unique in south asian co uh, context for example this uh, elephant skull which was found this is one of the rare you know cases in the south asian context so the site was the stone tools found with that particular elephant was actually the butcher, butchering tools. So you have a site where people butchered something like that. So uh, the elephant was butchered there. So these sites had to be protected. Go and see the site. You will see that there is a huge construction has been done by the people around the site. And the whole area is, you know, uh, the, the caribas are gone the uh, soil has been removed and that has been used for the construction purpose of the railways and other things. Government has done that, in fact. So when you allow people to do that, the things will discontinue. The connection with the heritage, culture, identity will discontinue. So that's what happened in Kashmir. Big sir, let me get you in here. I have two questions for you. Uh, I had mentioned that, you know, there isn't a sitting ASI uh, circle in charge in Srinagar. They sit out of Jammu. Uh, a lot of the problems happened in the 90s when the militancy uh, 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 got, uh, you know, uh, uh, renewed in uh, the Kashmir Valley, and there was a, a breakdown, uh, politically speaking. Is archaeology, history, heritage still suffering the backlog of that period? Uh, uh, is this one place where things haven't come back to normalcy? You allow me to react to a very pertinent issue which you touch, which is a cultural memory. Uh, and yes, then come to this. Yes, please. You know, what has happened, and we need to understand this, we have officialized archaeology. It's something which has to be done in an official process. Our cultural memory is in our vernacular. True. That's very true. Yeah. And it's in our, it still exists in our literature. We have a combined Shavite and Islamic patronage of saints, Laldet on one side, 14th century, Sheikh Ulalam on another side, and Sheikh Ulalam calling Laldet as her spiritual mother, who was a Shavite and he was a Muslim. And it continues till date. They are both living poets, living mystics in Kashmir, and I'm talking about 21st century. Because that exists in vernacular, that's not officialized. Subsequently, from Parmanan to Rahmanda or to whoever in the poetry, in our literature, if you go to our architecture, mm. our architecture is really, the vernacular architecture is something which is very unique. And we have imbibed forms, motifs, spaces, both from Buddhist past and Hindu past, and they exist in Muslim shrines. If you look at temples on River Jhelum, you need to know something about temples, you would know it to tell you that there's a temple, otherwise it's such a beautifully amalgamated, integrated part of the whole site. And we know shrines and a temple existing or coexisting alongside on the River Jhelum, which the River Jhelum, I think, is the most defining thing of history of Kashmir, of the life of Kashmir, is both vernacular. Anyway, that was 
talking about the cultural memory i thought one must mention what happened in 90 was that there was a total collapse here we faced a tremendous kind of insurgency here which devastated our infrastructure our social fabric and everybody knows i won't be adding to the knowledge of people around who are are listening viewers this time what has happened but then subsequently things settled down that was the time in 1990 when even banks shifted out of kashmir we didn't have banking system for about a year as it should have been we had small branches here and there most of the central government offices shifted out obviously article survey of india also shifted out and they went to jammu you know jammu locality they still have this article survey of india srinagar office but things stabilized in first four years and six stabilized at a level but every department came back and there were about 80 central government departments and most of them have returned except one department that is article survey of india now it's no gain saying that they don't have staff here obviously when this sa doesn't sit here who is supposed to be sitting here they are importance of the department is lost and for last 10 years now we don't even have a proper essay superintending archaeologist for srinagar circle even in jammu it is an additional charge for somebody sitting in chennai or somebody sitting so at other places i wouldn't say the monuments which are under protection of asi are in danger of being encroached i wouldn't make that statement i don't i think asi bangalore looks after their monument they have posted staff there no doubt but no further archaeological work has been taken place. But that would only happen when there were people around. Not only that, people like Ajmal, we have an archaeology department in Kashmir. Others have been approaching us in the tourism department also. They would like to take on archaeology. I've now in Haryana and Punjab there are about hundred excavations taking place. In Kashmir, we have been breaking our head. Rules have been twisted in a manner. That's where this officialization of archaeology comes in. And the net result has been that we lose focus on the main task. That is something which needs to be looked at. That was the question about which yes, got you. Yes, it was. was. In fact, I must uh, tell our viewers that Bakes up uh, actually organized a fabulous uh, exhibition just before uh, the lockdown. I think before COVID hit us, uh, yeah. the sacred spaces and sacred architecture of Kashmir. We must talk yes, about that Bakes up. We just, will. We will. Beautiful, but Kiki, I want to get uh, you in here and ask a very uncomfortable question because you know you've been outside Kashmir and you've interacted with people. You know, it frustrates me when people I meet who are non-historians, non-archaeologists, non—you uh, know—people uh, 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 who don't understand the culture of Kashmir, who talk about Kashmir as the Hindu Kashmir and the Muslim Kashmir and how the Hindu monuments are being treated badly, etc., etc. But that's such a terribly biased opinion about what is happening in kashmir also because monuments per se are, have been ignored and that's not just a kashmir issue it is a pan indian issue i'm sure you also deal with these people what is your response to see the simple thing is uh, i always tell people see when you study history you have to first study it without emotions and then you have to take off your uh, if you're wearing glasses which are tinted by the color of religion you will never see the real history when you read history you have to keep your own personal uh, you know prejudices aside whether it's a religious prejudice or a linguistic prejudice or racial prejudice so you have to keep that aside and as far as uh, the condition of say uh, a very contentious issue nowadays is uh, the condition of temples in kashmir you know there are many temples like this all over india and of course there are uh, i think the historical temples in kashmir are still like that of course there might not be a lot of crowd there there but they are mostly left on their own and all the ones which are under asi are taken good care of and this is a general apathy which is seen all over the country there are abandoned temples and you know all over the country it's not just the case of kashmir and in, in the case of kashmir it's just not just temples there are there are mosques there is like the uh, near the magdum sahib shrine uh, there is Uh, the Akhumulla Mosque, which is an abandoned mosque, and uh, there are many other things like this, which are it's, it is just apathy. It, it doesn't have anything to do with religion. Of course, everybody, if, see if you want to nitpick, you can nitpick on anything, you know. And especially in in a very uh, 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 the world, especially I, I would say in in this social media world, everything is becoming to uh, you know uh, things are getting even more polarized. Polarizing. Let me put. Take the example of one particular site, which is fascinating, and I know Ajmal has done work on it. Kiki, you wrote about it when you uh, for us on Lehu Street, and that's the Harwan Monastery. 
So it is believed that the first Buddhist council happened at the Mahayana council happened at the time. It was terribly significant fight as far as Buddhism is concerned in India. Uh, Kiki, what was uh, it like when you went over there? Uh, what was the condition? And was there any kind of uh, you know site museum? Was there any kind of conservation? Was there any kind of knowledge on the Harwan? See, as I told you, while I grew up growing up in Kashmir, I, we never knew about the Harwan Monastery. You know, we we you know, didn't even know that uh, Kashmir had a Buddhist heritage as well. Everybody is always talking about a Hindu Kashmir or Muslim Kashmir. Everybody forgot about, okay, it used to be at one time, a point of time, a great cradle of Buddhism. You know, and one of the very few remaining uh, sites uh, which, which we know of is the Harwan Monastery. And uh, the day I went there, I remember I was just driving past, I saw this boat. I just stopped my car and I decided to have a look. And the first time I went there, I couldn't find it. You know, then the next time I went, I saw it on Google Maps. I saw it on Google Earth, what it was, where it was. And I realized I should have climbed more. So the next time I went, I went, uh, managed to go all the way up there. And there was nobody there. Of course, it was December. So there were no tourists or anyway, no tourists don't go there. I just met a pair of foxes over there who were surprised to see a human over there. So, uh, but one thing I would like to mention, it was well maintained. But of course, there was nobody there. Uh, uh, forget about a site museum. I could, I could have picked up anything from there. You know, there was. Uh, it's like uh, as you mentioned, it was the, the site of the Fourth Buddhist Council, and it was at this Fourth Buddhist Council where you know a lot of Mahayan Buddhism went. It's actually when the Buddhism split into Mahayan and uh, uh, Kinyan, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, Buddhist monks after this uh, uh, Buddhist council went uh, uh, towards, uh, you know, Ladakh and Central Asia and from there on to China and Korea. So, Southeast Asia happened after that. So let me get Ajmal, and Ajmal, you've done a paper on, on Harwan and I think uh, the, the, uh, the fourth Buddhist council. It is debated, but it is largely accepted that it played a very important role in Buddhism. Till the eighth century, Kashmir was a very big Buddhist center. Now, you know, Ladakh has a great Buddhist uh, legacy as well. And sadly now, because we've not taken care of this and staked our claim on this great uh, bridge that Kashmir was in, in spreading the faith, what has happened is China is taking over the entire narrative about the spread of the faith to the Silk Route. And I, and I think that part of the one um, band, one road policy is this cultural legacy that... Uh, they claim to have, but isn't it sad that you know such a large chunk of Kashmir's very important history um, is not available for us? And while we can, uh, you know, uh, be completely awestruck by the great Gandhara sculptures, etc., and the great Kushan legacy, we don't know so much about the uh, Buddhist legacy. That's true. When we talk about Harvan, so Harvan has been mentioned, and people are still believing that this has been the one of the earliest sites. And in fact, R.C. Kaak, when he excavated in 1992 Harvan, it was the first, you know, full-fledged site excavation in Kashmir. So the first excavated site in the records is Harvan. Before that, it was Ushkur also, but the excavation not, was not that scientific one. But R.C. Kaak excavated this site, uh, horizontal excavation was done, whole site was exposed. These three, you know, terraces at Harvan, there are three terraces at Harvan. In fact, there are four terraces, but one terrace of the site was left unexcavated. And we have three terraces right now. And these three terraces has a whole plan, whatever constructions were done during, the, uh, during that period of time. And it's believed that Kanishka himself has built it. The whole plan resembles the plan which is uh, which was, uh, you know, uh, done by Kanishka at Surukh Kotal in Afghanistan. There was one of the sites in Afghanistan which was uh, built during the Kanishka's time. That's called Surukh Kotal, and the Surukh Kotal has a similar plan what we have it on, uh, at Harman, as well as Tegzila. For example, I will tell you one example of that. The absidal stupa. There is a stupa called some. Some people tell it as absidal temple, and some people refer it as absidal stupa. It was on the top terrace at Harman. So the whole structure, similar structure has been found uh, in Surakotal and similar structure to some extent has been found in Taxila also. 
So all these connections during the Kushan period and that too, when the king himself has built all these three monuments makes sense actually. So this is the uh, particularly considered to be the second century AD structure and the tiles from Harvan, which was earlier mentioned by um, Salim Beg Sab also. These tiles, whenever you see these tiles, it has not been the similar style of construction of a pavement around the stupa has not been reported outside the geographical boundary of Kashmir. It's a concentric circle, uh, uh, you know, structure, a uh, lot of circles built in, in a concentric manner. And then all these tiles are decorated, very well decorated and put on the place as a pavement, right? So when you look at this whole scenario and the art on the tiles, you see this art has influenced, you, you can see that whole of the Silk Route area has this, you know, art depicted, whatever we have seen on the tiles. The daily lives of the people at the Harvan or the Kashmir Valley has been depicted on these tiles. Apart from that, some figures are so much resembling to the, even to the Egyptian motifs. You know, some people, uh, there was a, in 2008, there was a site discovery of, um, uh, uh, Barzika Waleh site was discovered in Iran, in the Ilam province. So similar type, you know, tiles were recovered from there. And you will be, you know, uh, you will be surprised to see that those tiles from Iran and the tiles from Kashmir are quite similar. So this is so, this is, this was the, basically the transmission of, you know, technology, art, you know, uh, ideas through this Silk Road. And it goes true along with this Buddhist thing as well. I mean, Buddhism reached to Kashmir, whether it reached from the uh, India or somewhere else, that is still debatable. But from Kashmir, it emerged, the philosophy of the Buddhism emerged. You, you said, said about the fourth Buddhist council was organized in Kashmir and most of the people still believe that it was organized in Harvan. We have not yet found such an evidence while it is mentioned, Harvan is mentioned as a fourth Buddhist council site, but there is a strong references done by the, uh, you know, uh, this, this uh, Hyun Song when he uh, mentioned, and the Buddhist, there was a Buddhist uh, historian from uh, Tibet uh, known as Taranath. So Taranath's references are very, very, uh, you know, uh, conclusive references he has given about the fourth Buddhist council, which was held in Kashmir. So there are people who are in dis uh, disagreement with this particular, uh, you know, uh, argument, but there are references which prove that Kashmir has been the great, great civilizational center, particularly for the Buddhist uh, philosophy. And Mahayana emerged. Some people even believe that Mahayana emerged from uh, Kashmir. When you see that from the geographical boundaries of Kashmir, uh, outside the geographical boundaries of Kashmir, when you see this uh, religion spreading, and it has to be towards the northern regions, towards the Central Asia, and there are emerging evidence from Kashgar, Khotan, and other Central Asian regions that this particular religion traveled from Kashmir to other parts of the Central Asia and uh, China, eventually reached it to China. So this is this is accepted version overall. Right. In fact, you know, the very fact that we're talking about only Kashmir and not talking about Jammu and Ladan just shows how storied each of these regions are and they should not be clubbed together because there's so much of other things that you need to talk about each of these days, uh, uh, places. Uh, so let me get you in. I have got two questions for you. You know, we know that it was a great Buddhist center, civilization, it was a center of philosophy, of thought. There was such a syncretic movement. Still the eighth century, you have the Buddhist. Then you have this great movement of Shaivism that happens in Kashmir. You have the Sufi traditions of uh, Kashmir that you referred to. And you have great scholars. Nagarjuna came from Kashmir, uh, from the area of the Harman mo Monastery. You have, um, you know, Abhinava Gupta who comes from Kashmir. You have, uh, you know, so many great scholars in Kashmir. You know, you spoke about the vernacular literature, you know, the vernacular uh, body of work that kind of represents what is being done to nurture that, translate that, bring that uh, to the fore. Because I think a very important part of heritage is not just the monuments and the, the physical, it's also the literary and the culture. Well, if you mean what has been done at the people's level, then a lot of it has been done and it's 
live there and we get noticed it gets notes only because it is in living memory let me make this statement as clear as it is in living memory we also talked about the architect sacred architecture if this is the time when one should talk about it Ar architecture i would call it unique but it's certainly different than the mainland architecture let me tell you that and let us start with a mosque which exists today in our living memory as a place of worship it has a prayer hall and prayer hall people go and offer prayers muslims go and offer in nimaz here and open spaces in all prayer halls of muslims are same like square or rectangular space that worshipers go and offer prayers but if you look at the total site you suddenly see instead of of a dome there's a shikhar there's no dome there might have come in last 10 years there's a different story but we have been building for the last about 700 years in kashmir now and all muslim structures sufi structures religious structures all sacred structures have this shikha they also have these trifles of stupas which we have seen in stupas this is what is their memory that is how they express their memory we also have in some shrines places of retreat small small rooms where these buddhist mystics would go and pray and offer prayer there or stay there in seclusion these things have been carried forward so it is really the imagination of their buddhist and hindu sacred past for which they have respect that's why they bring all these things to their physical form of monuments so that is how they express themselves to the medium of architecture to the medium of literature the medium of poetry are muslim saints or muslim mystic poets use almost the same imagery which our hindu poets use naming the god as shiva or whatever i don't want to get into that so as i said i would repeat that in our vernacular memory our cultural past is still alive in our monuments our cultural past is still Uh, alive it has been reappropriated reappropriated respectfully that has happened but everything is under stress now i won't make a claim that we are a shining example or like gandhi ji had said that he is seeing whatever he is a ray of light in kashmir in 47 there are many lights now sparkling on kashmir you know it's so sad big saab that history is often used as a divisive tool in india right but what we don't do is look at the cultural history like you rightly pointed out of the amalgamation of the coexistence of the co close relations between communities and it gets vitiated by the immediate past or events that you have a memory of but given that you know kashmir is under such stress and there is such a lot of political stress over there i would think it is even more important to nurture the historical cultural legacy of kashmir and do something about it so that the, the newer generations are not just given a one dimensional view of their past but a multi dimensional view what should we be doing very much so in fact to tell you frankly you know there's a body of opinion building up both in kashmir and outside kashmir among us kashmiris that it is the culture which is our route to peace only our culture which are root to peace but let us accept certain things like now knowledge is flowing through school system you can't run away from this from your textbooks that is where it exists that is how people pick up now parents pick up from children's books education system is one intervention where we could get into what are what you are calling the cultural past in an education system not just the curricula we did a project in kashmir for 3 years in 2012 2015 with dora bi tata trust and we called it art integrated learning project so we're talking about this syncretism through art we're talking about history through art and we use these mediums i must tell you we had classes it's not many some classes where we brought children from jammu who had migrated from kashmir and then they sat with children from kashmir we could see that this intervention through the education system both co and curriculum could take us a long way and there's a lot of stress which needs to be put on this unfortunately 
it's not being realized by the institutions of the state. Let me make a frank confession on this. Institutions of state don't think culture is the root. Once they realize, because fortunately or unfortunately, they have the tools and control of these institutions. Now, we are an institutional society as such. There's not much existing outside our institutions which are state regulated, if not state run. That is where we should look at these things. And I think, like Kiki mentioned, we didn't know about Burzum. It didn't exist in Kiki's school. It has to be there. The dialogue has to be there. You must have been going to a better school. But I will tell you, in villages, I have seen these things still being talked about. They are much more alive to it than the urban children. That is one of the observations we must make. Dealing with these teachers, we find them much better understanding on these issues than with people who are working in the urban areas. And unfortunately, the best schools are in the urban areas. Very well so put. Very well put. Yeah. Ajma, let me get you in here. You deal with students all the time. You're teaching at the university. What is the general sense that you're getting from them? You know, you also studied at the Deccan College of Archaeology in Pune. You know, when you go back and you teach your students, is there a, a move? And I'm not talking about just the history student. Is there awareness? What should be done to get students more uh, actively involved? Because, you know, it's such a fabulous heritage. I mean, kids should be involved. And I think this is a problem across India. So, you know, I don't think it's a Kashmir-specific problem, but how can it be more exciting for, for, for students? Uh, th this is a very important question. I would like to mention that uh, there was no school of archaeology or a PG course or a, any graduate course in archaeology in the whole state of Jammu and Kashmir quite, till quite recently. It was in 2017 that we uh, started a course in Kashmir University in Center of Central Asian Studies Department. Uh, that is a PG course in archaeology. And uh, we have already produced 20 students of first batch has already you know, passed out from that uh, one first batch of the students. So the thing is like, you know, why did we come to this that they, there is there's no hope until you produce your own you know, resource you know, from, uh, from your own young people. So because the thing is, the State Department of Archaeology and other, you know, cultural uh, departments, whoever is working, uh, you know, in the state of Jammu and Kashmir, they don't have qualified people for their own departments. That's the problem. So, Directorate of Archaeology, Archives and Museums, they don't have technical staff, which has to be, which should be there to take care of the antiquities, artifacts, in the museum and outside the museum. The archaeological sites, management, uh, the surveys, explorations, excavations has not been done. I, I don't remember any single in incident of the State Archives Department, what they have done, the excavation of any site, scientific excavation. So this was particularly our motive. We wanted to generate interest. We wanted to generate you know, uh, this uh, particular interest among the students, particularly the young generation. So we opened, we started a new department. Uh, uh, we are doing well, in fact. And the young generations, which the question was, uh, as you have put it, that they are very much inclined to their roots. So they are so happy to study while, while it's all began, actually. So why from Kashmir has started, emerged, originated. So this all, this is all new to them because as Beg Saab said already that it's not in the school books. It's not in the textbooks. Burzuhom, Harwan, Gufkral, Kanispur. These are, uh, these are uh, very important sites which has to be in the national curriculum basically, but it's not there. So why, whatever it is, it has to be, but when people, when people, particularly the young generation students, those who are inclined towards it, when they study, they become so fascinated about their own culture and they want to work. We have a couple of students who want to go for the, uh, you know, almost a dozen students who want to go for a further, uh, you know, to do research in archaeology in Kashmir. So this is a very welcome step and they are taking it positively, in fact. Yeah. We'll have some audience questions, of course, but. Tell me something, Ajman, uh, uh, when you talk about uh, interdisciplinary, is it possible to get children or students uh, initiated into history, even in from an interdisciplinary manner, not just history students, but also look at other students that have some kind of courses, some kind of a, 
uh, you know, um, you know, way of telling them about their local history? And doesn't the state board have uh, their own, uh, you know, normally in Maharashtra, for instance, the state board has its own curriculum and part of that is regional history. Does something like that uh, uh, exist in Kashmir? Very little and quite recently it has been adopted to some extent, I would say. Uh, so uh, basically the thing is like, you know, uh, these people, uh, whoever at the helm of affairs, they particularly belong to some other state or, you know, some other cultural background. So the thing is that the whatever is in within the state has not been highlighted. So the problem is there, but quite recently I have heard it that it has started, the moment has started that people are, you know, uh, some, some uh, particular regional history has been, you know, uh, people have started to, you know, teach the students in the schools, in the lower level also. But, but recently there was a one major, uh, you know, I would call it a breakthrough in fact, uh, that, uh, you know, higher education has started a single based course, one paper of archeology span for uh, graduates. So that's a well, very welcome step, but this will take a quite a you know a good number of years to come to the con uh, to come to the that consensus, and we might have in future you know uh, postgraduate uh, sorry uh, graduate degrees in archaeology, and might you know it might go into the temples two level also. So the things are moving into that direction, right? Thanks, sir. Yeah, I just want to talk about this textbooks. You know, in NCRT scheme, we have every school has to teach NCRT books. But NCRT is one thing that 75% of the text is courses from NCRT, but they also ask states to add 25% of the local content. Now, this is important. So they have a space for 25%, which is in the NCRT scheme. But we don't have people who can build content on 25%. I have, seen so I have seen a sociology book when we were doing this children project in 2015. We had a subject among out of this 25 person on crafts. So the person who had perhaps done the story on crafts had picked up something from Tamil Nadu. So it mentioned Tamil Nadu crafts there. But and if that's in Kashmir, then crafts, I mean, yeah, I'm sure there are certain issues which will get sorted over time, but I'll give you an instance here. When we were doing this teachers program, we also used to do pre-induction courses for teachers. I'll tell you an instant in 2014, I was taking a class of 60 teachers, all of them masters and PhDs. They had become teachers of education department. Now, for one month, they have to do a pre-induction course. One day was given to us also to talk about heritage. I asked a simple question to these teachers. This is 2015. That how many of you have gone to the museum? Will you believe me? Just one teacher has gone to the museum. I asked her, why did you go? She said a friend came from Delhi and I accompanied her to the museum. You must know they were, they are not to be blamed. Yeah. Curfews, closures, hartals. We don't have problems with present generation. We have problems with the generation which is teaching the present generation. Now who fills up this gap? God knows who will fill up this gap. Really, really. A battered, if you have to see a battered situation, you must come and see it here. It's I must tell you how much hard children are craving for good teachers, good knowledge, and I'm sure certain things have happened, but a lot needs to be done. Really? At the cutting edge, a lot needs to be done. Right. Uh, Prashant, you know, you live this problem, right? You face this problem of not knowing, but you also, for the last decade, decade and a half, the, the Himalayas, you know, you're passionate about it and your passion comes through in your writing. What do you think needs to be done? You know, you, are you a, a person who rediscovered the history of Kashmir and fell in love with it? You have so many kids out there who need to be infused. What do you think needs to be done? I think we need to, you know, uh, showcase history first. And I think social media is a good uh, platform um, to showcase stuff. Because nowadays people react to photographs and imagery. So as long as you post, you know, good photographs and write good stuff about uh, uh, things, it creates an interest. And and, and as far as uh, Bekhsan was talking about the museum, I, I don't think anybody goes to SPS Museum in Kashmir. Like whenever I've been there, I was probably the only one or there was one or two other people over there. And for me, so, you know, every day going from uh, when I was growing up in Kashmir, Going to school, uh, Gupkar Museum, the, the SPS Museum was on the way to our school. 
so sometimes we just we used to walk back from school and then we used to just go to the museum just like that you know we just fell on the way and then it had interesting you know, old stuff uh, the reason i used to go to the museum because it had these big bears and these uh, you know stuffed animals that was the only thing which attracted me when i was a student of course i was not interested in the old the old uh, historical stuff but now when i go there it's 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 an amazing place and the sad part is nobody goes to the museum in kashmir and uh, whenever anybody travels to kashmir you know people from outside were traveling there i tell them the best place to see is the museum if you have any interest in history go to the sps museum it's 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 uh, now in a good shape because they've shifted to a new building and everything so i think we need to highlight museums also you know because museums are now the holders of it's only once you go to a museum would you get interested in the places where all the stuff in the museum came from you know you see a harvan tile and then you would say okay i should go visit harvan or you see some tile from somewhere and all the stuff in the, the museum is a repository of you know everything of our history so if we go to the museum we will it opens many avenues for us and we could know you know what we are interested in so i think we need to focus on museums like local site museums or a main museum and you know keep people are interested in history it's just that you have to get across to them so that that's uh, and i don't really know of course the main way is through education but i'm sure there are other ancillary ways in which we can you know get people uh, interested in history going right ajman yeah i would like to add up something uh, kk has said already prashant has said so uh, the thing is like you know museums are very much you know that has to be the educational museum right so the thing is with the sps museum is like when you go inside you need to showcase from the earliest to the latest that is the trend in the museums you know you need to say from the uh, you know check out whether where is the earliest so the case with the sps museum is that there is a neolithic gallery and the, that neolithic gallery has nothing from burzohom burzohom being an you know very important site to the culture of identity culture of kashmir nothing is displayed at uh, sps museum in uh, 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 for, from burzohom excavated site so excavated material which was excavated from burzohom it went to uh, asi and asi shifted that material to delhi and the skeletal remains whatever were found from the archaeological site of burzohom it went to the anthropological survey of india uh, office to kolkata so the things went that way and there has been lot of pleas made by the state government department that uh, please return that uh, whatever you have and you you believe that these artifacts such a valuable cultural treasure from kashmir is lying is stored in a in a dilapidated condition in a uh, in a purana kila uh, storehouse okay there are lot of things in a purana kila storehouse which is scary because you know, i know people who've done excavations in the 70s and 80s and what they found is still in the purana kila excavation exactly that. similar happened to the material so, from borzohom similar thing happened a special episode on just that purana kila storehouse ajman but you know bakes are let me come to you every time i i look at borzohom and i am obsessed with borzohom i studied it as a student and i thought it was fascinating for our viewers it's you know a neolithic site where they found pits in the ground where people used to live it's really spectacular and so much of material was found there but uh, bake sahab look at stonehenge right i mean stonehenge is one of the greatest uh, uh, yeah. tourist attractions in england and uh, you know burza home could be stonehenge right i mean it could be india's stonehenge totally, yeah. uh, one of the most famous no you were heading the tourism department tell me you know kashmir while it is known for conflict it is also one of india's most loved tourist centers if it is such a big tourist center and you were part of the you know you were heading the tourism department why wasn't enough done to create a stonehenge kind of a place in burza home to create one or two of these great uh, sites even a parihaspura which is lalitaditya's capital into an important tourist site because you do get so many tourists you know in in a good year why can't you expand and world over people travel for history and culture well that is true you are very right cultural tourist is the most preferred tourist any country or any society place could have and tourism department has done some work in that direction but we are as good or as bad as government departments can be so let's accept that but to be on the tourism side let me tell you whatever literature was published in terms of brochures in terms of small documentaries films only the tourism department which has done it in fact with the support of central tourism department 
not from archaeology, not from history, not from any other department. A lot of work has been done, but a lot remains to be done. I would accept that. And if that is done, it would mean something very great and big for the state as also for the country. That much I must tell you. Right. We have more questions, but let's take some audience questions now, and then I'll come back to our panelists for their questions. And I think we've got some fabulous questions, which kind of iterate and reiterate the concern about the heritage in Kashmir and what needs to be done. My first question is, uh, uh, coming for a, from a viewer who's asked, what is the current condition of the historical capital cities of Kashmir, such as Parehaspura and Avantipura? Uh, do they have a protected status? Uh, uh, Prashant did a couple of stories for us on uh, Parehaspura, etc. But uh, Ajmal, let me come to you. Uh, what is the status? Uh, these are, of course, Parehaspura is a centrally protected uh, site, but uh, what is the status of these sites on the ground? Yeah, this is a nice question because a lot of these monuments have come under uh, the uh, protected uh, monuments under uh, Archaeological Survey of India. So it's still a protected monument, uh, Parihaspora, but the around, if you see the condition around the, uh, you know, uh, the site, protected site, protected part of the site, basically, and the whole area is now become a mining field for the people. So this has become too much, you know, from last couple of years. There is a lot of digging going on. People are removing the soil for construction purpose, and that that will affect the in the in the coming years. It will hugely affect, you know, uh, because of the reasons that uh, whole area around this have been, you know, these are the caribou lands, as I was earlier, you know, talking about. These are the caribou lands, and these lake strand deposits have a lot of archaeological value as well. So the protected part is very small very small protected part, but around the site is a huge archaeological importance of that area, but that is not being protected. So uh, it will eventually, but it will come down to the uh, protected part of the site and it will you know, affect that, uh, that area as well. So the need is the area around that area, the mining has to be stopped. So, and second part of it is like conservation and preservation. So conservation is not being done. That's a very, you know, we can we can actually put it like that. So uh, archaeological survey of India has not done any. I don't remember any instance from last couple of years. I guess at least five years that any project was you know uh, started at Pariaspora for conservation purpose or further enhancement of the uh, you know uh, area. Only thing I guess in a couple of years they have done is the fencing part of it. So hence sure. the whole site has been fenced, but rest of the things have not been done. That's the current steps. Takes up, uh, we are all familiar with Pulwama, but very few people know that that is also the site of Avantipura, the great yeah. capital of, uh, of uh, Kashmir, uh, with some fabulous monuments. In fact, while, uh, you know, one could say Martan, uh, te Sun Temple is well known, Parihaspura is well known. Why isn't Avantipura as well known? What is the situation over there if this is the situation at Parihaspura? Well, Avantipura Temple per se, not the city is under ASI protection. Mm -hmm. And by and large, the protected area is in good shape. But as Ajmal was saying, let me tell you, what is this whole scheme of monument protected but area being vandalized? The law says that protected area is only the area which is notified within the monument. And then there is a prohibited area, which is 100 meters after the protected area. And that is where ASI role comes in. They have to administer not only the monument area which belongs to them, the protected, they also have to look after property area with no construction, no digging is permitted, but that's not happening because ASA hardly exists here. Right. But I would, I would I would say that the, by and large the temple is properly protected. In fact, all these monuments, including these temples, which are in the charge of archaeological department or even the state archaeology, but it's just not the monument, it's the site which is very important, which is more It has to be seen in the context of the entire site, right? Yeah. Now, yeah. I'm going to ask uh, you a, a very pertinent question come from Karthik uh, Date. He asks, uh, how can we as people confront history in a way which can end up in making our presence peaceful, where it goes back to the cultural memory uh, subject that we had taken earlier, the fact that history is used for divisiveness rather than for peace and uh, identifying the common history, the common legacy that we as people have. And it's only uh, more evident in Kashmir than elsewhere. So 
So, Bek Saab, it's a very, very pertinent question, and I think uh, I would really like to iterate the importance of this. Uh, the question, how can people confront history in a way which can end up making the present peaceful? What needs to be done for that? Well, a couple of things. Certain things on campus, certain things off campus. We are geographically very wrongly located. We have neighbors who have never been very kind and very friendly to us. We know that. I don't think the problem is much on campus within the Kashmir. It is the stresses which are coming from outside the forces come from outside. And I, when I say outside, from all sides, which are destabilizing the place. That is one thing which is political. But I would also say that we have, at some point in time, to a degree, also got swayed with this international kind of a thing where extremism has flourished. It has happened in all societies, not just the Kashmir. And that is a greater challenge. And I don't think anybody has a ready-made solution for this challenge, except that the saner element is the people who care about it, who mind about it, have to put their act together and try to carry conviction with people. I don't think we have any ready-made solutions which can be given. Because not everything is happening within Kashmir, let me assure you that. Right. If Kashmir is left to Kashmiris, I can assure you, even as of today, we will in a year stabilize. It's not left to us. Right. You know, it's, it's the importance of conversations like this that I think will counter the, the negative. True. And I think this has to become a larger platform where we start talking about these issues because it's, uh, you know, it will really uh, help use history and cultural legacy as a balm rather than as a knife to, you know, uh, go, through, uh, go through the very fabric of Kashmir. Let's get to Irfan Guzar's question here. Uh, 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 Ajman, let me come to you with this. He says, will the attempts to bring Guzar home artifacts back to Kashmir museums from other parts of India help locals know and be interested in heritage? Should we get the Burza home artifacts back? Uh, is that going to help matters? Yeah, this is this is pertinent question. In fact, when we talk about the Neolithic part of Kashmir, we don't have anything to showcase rather than we have Burzoham and Gufral, because these were the two sites which were ex extensively excavated by Archaeological Survey of India. Once the excavation material was collected, it was sent to the other, you know, for analysis purpose, and it never returned. The repatriation of cultural heritage is the phenomena happening throughout the globe. You know, people are, you know, quite recently we received a couple of, you know, uh, uh, you know, artifacts, uh, statues from uh, foreign countries to India. So this is happening in a global level. But in Kashmir, the case of Kashmir is particularly, it's very much important because it should be done with, with an immediate effect, I, I should say, because the, as I earlier said that the SPS museum has no, not a single artifact from Bur Burzohan. So people who go and check in uh, to the you know SPS museum, they don't have any you know uh, you know uh, Burzohan artifacts over there. So people are afraid that if this continues, if this continues to happen in Kashmir in the future, in these uh, you know uh, excavations, the material will be retrieved and will be, that will be sent back again to you know different parts of the country. Right. So this, this has to be taken up, and in fact, I guess it's a, it's taken up by the uh, state archaeology department. But it has been long overdue, I guess. So we have to do it. Now, going to museums is not the only answer because we've got a very pertinent point, Bakes up from Tara Dhar Hasnain, who's asked and who's commented that I have been to SPS Museum and I wrote about it in a Singapore Museum magazine, but the curators were abysmal and even the captions were awful. Uh, uh, Padma Pani labeled as Padmani and uh, that was what they found over there. And I was told to pay thousands to take a picture of any artifact. I think it has to change. Now, I don't know whether museums came under tourism department. Uh, I think it would have come under ASI and archeology span department, but that's a constant missive I also have when I go to Indian museums. Uh, of course, Kiki was shaking his head, so he thinks that the museum is okay, but I'll come back to you, Kiki. But let me get Begsab into this conversation. Begsab, at the end of the day, even our curators in our museums don't know very much about these artifacts. They've done a very shoddy job of, you know, putting these things together. Uh, we need a full rethink, don't we? I would agree with Tara on this. This has happened not only in this museum, in other museums also. I was once in Bhopal and 
the Persian manuscript was labeled as Arabic manuscript. And then in Kashmir also have seen this. And this is a sad story. We are, there are, things are wrongly labeled. Which is, and then this is a very archaic thing. It used to be there for photography that they will not produce it or make commercial use of it. Now, this thing is gone. And really now they allow photography with these small phone cameras. But you still have to pay a fee if you have to do a proper photograph of an object there because they say this is for commercial. But that must go. This is something which is embarrassing now. And we right, have to cross India, Bikram. You will now. I have, and you can take a picture of the Mona Lisa. You can go and get the Rosetta yes, Stone at the British Museum. But you cannot take pictures, but you can take I, selfies in Indian yeah, culture. Selfies so are. I, I find it the most ridiculous because they're undermining. Uh, artifacts by, by you know putting these and even now we are having a dialogue with museum telling them if a good picture ta is taken for the object in SPS museum that will help you get people that will help you people get people to know what you have extreme and then, both Ajman and Kiki into this for quick comments before I go to the next question Kiki uh, yeah, see um, uh, SPS museum is walking distance from my house in uh, Kashmir so whenever I have nothing better to do, I just go to the museum and just hang around. And usually I'm the only person in the museum. And uh, I have a small uh, Sony RX100 camera, which fits into my pocket. So the first time I went there, I just took it out and started taking pictures. And then somebody came up to me and he said, sir, you can't take pictures and you'll have to pay a fee. So I said, okay, I'm ready to pay. And he took me outside, I paid 150 bucks. And after that, I was free to take any picture. I have so many, I think I have the best collection of SPS uh, museum pics. Nobody has so many pics as I have. And nobody stops you from taking pics over there. Especially okay. since they've set up the new galleries, they've moved to the new building. Okay, uh, so that, uh, so, I, I so think actually the thing is people go once and then they get discouraged. But keep doing it again and again. One day they will tell you, okay, take pictures. No problem. Take it. But even as of today, the rule exists that if you want to do a proper photography of museum objects, you have to pay a fee, which must go. That, that's must ask people, encourage people to come and do it. has a problem with that. It's just the, the, the red tape and the and the general sense yeah. that they are protectors and gatekeepers rather than yes, yes, yes. encouraging people to come and actually true. engage with the artifacts. I that is true. Yeah, so that, that's for commercial purpose. If somebody is taking pictures and putting it in a book form and for the commercial use of it, so that has to be paid. But I'll tell you one thing that there was a mission, National Monuments, uh, sorry, this uh, documentation projects under the, that documentation mission, what happened, all these artifacts, whatever was lying in the uh, museum storerooms that were, you know, uh, uh, photographs were taken. And now there is a website where everything is available online. So the issue is, it doesn't make sense to pay for anything, you know, which is actually, which has to be actually online. Now, Ajmal, I'll tell you one thing. We in Intech, under this national mission, have document, photographed and documented all decorative arts of the museum, not the archaeology. And that is, I have a copy and it's also given to the museum, also to the national mission. National mission, as of today, have not uploaded those photographs. It's easier said than done. Somebody yeah. wants to look for a good shawl but, photograph. Yeah. I have taken the photograph. It is already in the, with the agencies. Nobody is uploading. But over here, we must take a leaf uh, out of what uh, the yeah. international museums do. do. And very often in Live History India, we yeah. have easier access to the British Library and the VNA Museum in uh, uh, London than we have to our own museum, which is really a pity, if you ask me, because, uh, you know, I think every picture from a museum is an ad for that museum and it should be promoted you know i would like to add one thing here i mean saying this i mean you had mentioned that if it is commercially used we must pay we are publishing a book in fact two books these days and we have accessed photographs from victoria and albert museum we sent in a request and we said that we are publishing in this book they didn't charge us any money they gave us fee get, give them credit right because they're just to give them credit and they're happy a book says this piece is lying in Victor and Albert. Our people think everything is commercial. We must change it. And we are, you know, how keen we are on this and we have been fighting for this. I hope this happens sooner than later. Right. We've got such lovely questions. I'm going to take some of them uh, very quickly. Uh, uh, Raja Basin says, isn't the neg neglect of uh, our museums span India, Malays? I'm, I'm presuming you're talking about museums, but it could 
also hold true for our monuments? Yes, it is a pan India malaise. Uh, Mm, uh, well, uh, we've also got a question uh, uh, saying that, uh, one second, uh, it, it says that, can you please let me know about Kashmiri Shaivism? This is a question from Nitin Kulkarni uh, and in context to the archaeological findings. Ajman, of course, Shaivism uh, uh, is something that Kashmir is known for. But from a historical sites point of view, what are the main prominent sites and what is the status of, of this uh, uh, part of Kashmir's heritage? Yeah, this is an interesting question because one part of Shaivism was the Trika Shaivism, which, which was supposed, which, which people believe that it actually developed and the, all the philosophy generated was from Kashmir only. So in archaeological context, there was not much material culture which could be dedicated wholly and solely to the Shaivism. But there are some references and from archaeological point of view, some uh, monuments are there. For example, I have heard of, and there are some literary evidences also, that the, uh, the now as a cantonment area in Srinagar, Badami Bagh. Within that premises, that's a cantonment area and a huge one. So within that premises, there are a couple of you know, uh, temples uh, discovered and that, is, uh, that has been looked by the military people. ASI has only protected them and on uh, military and uh, you know, these uh, security pe people, they look uh, uh, to those monuments. And those monuments, I have heard that there were some uh, artifacts recovered which could be related to the Shaivism, particularly Trika Shaivism. So as of now, out of that, I don't think there is any other, but philosophical part of it is there. A lot of literature has been, you know, uh, built up on Trika Shaivism from Kashmir. So that part is there, but not the archaeological point of view. I don't guess there are many. Right. Uh, there is another question by Dipanjan Mitra who asks, how much do you think it is important to also disseminate the heritage narratives not just within a state, but to create an interstate dialogue in order to appreciate and be vocal. Can the societies and trusts and other stakeholders collaborate to make it lucid and accessible beyond state boundaries? You know, I was thinking of this when I was reading about Harman um, uh, Monastery and uh, Nagarjuna. And, you know, Nagarjuna has such a, and the great Buddhist monk Nagarjuna and, and the philosopher, because he has such an important play, place even in. Andhra Buddhism, and there's so many sites, including, uh, you know, uh, uh, big stupas, which are connected to him. So, uh, you know, in the Buddhist circuit, for example, Beksa, I mean, there is such a lot of interconnectivity. There is such a lot of interconnectivity, even in the Islamic, uh, you know, the Mughal connection we know of, but there's so many interconnected places. Is it a problem that we are looking very inward when we are looking at state uh, or, or regional legacies? Should we be more outward? looking at collaborative studies across different states, etc. Well, so as Kashmir is concerned, I think it holds true more about Kashmir than other parts and places we have been talking about. It has been a place which had a connect all over, which had, which had a connect beyond its borders. And these connections need to be revived and restored. Not much has been done. We are talking about Buddhism since yesterday. So Buddhism is something which is really unexplored, mostly unexplored in Kashmir. Uh, initially in 60s, certain works were done by ASI, they didn't move beyond that. In fact, the greatest treasure of Buddhism about this fourth Buddhist council is the decisions or the edicts which were, which came out of this fourth council were written on a copper plates. And Hyun Song says these copper plates are buried somewhere in Kashmir. Wow. I don't think much has been done to locate these places. We know stray instances from scholars that it should be here, it should be there. And once that secret is exposed or explored, I don't know where we reach. We really reach somewhere where nobody else would have reached. So there's a lot of Buddhist archaeology which is unexplored, unattended. We have about five Buddhist sites now, the major being Hav and somewhere in Ushkar, somewhere in Padagampur, some small activity in and as Ajmal was saying, but that is something we need. This Buddhist circuit project we had prepared in tourism department. In fact, I had some say in doing that, and we had listed certain things which it still today, it, as of today, it only exists in the literature. But once you move beyond literature, things 
come up. You know, you are asked a question about this Shaivism. Shaivism is a philosophy. So in texts and manuscripts, it exists. But it also had an archaeological link. Most of it was pointed out by Kalana. Mm -hmm. Kalana is 12th century, and he had already seen Abhinav Gopthiyas, in Vasu Gopthiyas, and all others. What Satyan did, he wrote a book, which is Ancient Archaeology of Kashmir, based on Kalana's finds or Kalana's history, or whatever he had mentioned. He was able to locate most of the sites in archaeological, physical, and material terms. So a lot of work has to be similarly done for Buddhism. Sorry to say, yeah. sorry to say, even ASI didn't think it very important or very easy or whatever reason. They didn't really work on this track. I'm okay. sure a time will come when the world will wake up to the Buddhist past of Kashmir. Right. Ajman, I want to get you in here because uh, in talking about archaeology, you refer to the fact that there haven't been fresh excavations in uh, Kashmir for the longest time. Now, do you uh, look at the look at it as a post militancy kind of uh, situation, post nineties, or was it earlier? And my second point is somewhere across India, I find, and you you've been very closely involved with the Deccan College of Archaeology. You've been involved in excavations in the Bhagar Valley, in Rakhi Gadi, in Junnar, in Maharashtra. In some ways, I feel that the ASI has given up this mandate of excavation, and the universities are driving it now be it the Baroda University, be it uh, the Archaeology Muse uh, uh, um, uh, University in uh, Pune, or even now in Kerala. So in a sense, is the gap, uh, the fact that your archaeology department is just being launched and perhaps there will be a better hope that, you know, you guys will do it? Or do you think uh, that, uh, you know, it is ASI's mandate? How do you see it panning out here? It's a, it's a wonderful question. Basically, what future holds for Kashmir in, in, in relation to archaeology. So one part of your question was, was it because of the militancy and the you know, things around it that decades, we haven't seen any archaeological excavation? That's quite in fact true, because one of the reasons was that, that uh, the earlier excavations which were held in Kashmir from 1950s onwards uh, were done by Archaeological Survey of India. And most of these people appointed as essays in Archaeological Survey of India uh, while from outside. Once this thing happened, you know, in 1990s, they left, as Salim Beksab was saying all, already, that uh, the whole department shifted to Jammu. So because of that, the, this part of, uh, you know, excavations could not be conducted. That was a true thing. Second thing, the existing department of Directorate of Archaeology, Archives and Museums of Jammu and Kashmir they had, they had the mandate of, you know, excavating, but they never did it. Mm -hmm. So that part was also lacking. Third part, the third point is that there was no department of archaeology in any of the universities in whole state of Jammu and Kashmir. So doing research from, you know, archaeological on archaeology from university uh, was very uh, difficult. So that was the real reason that all these things halted for a quite uh, quite for a long time. Right. So, but in future, we hope because since we started PG program in archaeology in 2017 at Center of Central Asian Studies in Kashmir University, and we have already started with the excavation in 2017. But in between some two years, we have you know the things were not quite well. So, but we have already applied for excavations for Burzuham. And in future, we'll be doing more. And we have started the collaborative, uh, you know, uh, works done by with other universities, especially with foreign universities. We have a projects of uh, from the uh, University of Sydney, Australia. We have a project from, you know, Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography from Russia. So similarly, we have a collaboration with French Institute, so EPH, EPSL University in uh, Paris. So all these collaborations are materializing. Apart from that, within the Indian context, we will be, you know, uh, hopefully we'll be doing a couple of collaborations within Indian context with Deccan College Pune and many other institutions around. So we hope that this will take a momentum now. So because we want to work, the infrastructure for the research is building up in our, uh, you know, department. So quite recently we have acquired high-end equipments as well. So for the excavation and exploration purpose. So this thing will, you know, take a pace now, I guess. Right, you know, uh, uh, Bakes, uh, this is a question that is often asked. Uh, there, there's a whole body of work around it. And I, I don't have 
the answers. But Money Abraham from uh, the US has asked this question that somebody mentioned to him uh, that there is evidence of early Christian uh, influence or connections in Kashmir. Um, is there any historical evidence of this? You know, uh, I know there is a theory that, you know, uh, connecting Jesus Christ to Kashmir, but outside that, you know, that is one thing that, you know, we don't know about. The second is that it was a very important part of the Silk Route. It was the area of ideas and people moving up and down. It was a very, very, uh, you know, uh, it was a melting pot of people of different kinds. So in many senses, this role of Kashmir as a crossroads of cultures, of faiths, quite like Kerala, because Kerala had the ports, you know, the great ports of New Zealand, et cetera, which acted as a gateway to the world. In many senses, Kashmir was also a gateway to the world, wasn't it? That is true, but the specific question was about Christ having come to Kashmir or the Christian past of Kashmir. Unfortunately, there's no historic or archaeological evidence to that effect. A couple of books have been written, but they are more in the realm of conjectures and legends than anything real about Christ's arrival in Kashmir. There's also some religious overtone because a particular sect of Muslims promoted this. That's one part. The other part is Kashmir has been not only a melting pot, it has been a very shining example of radiating ideologies and philosophies all over. And we were part of a major landscape of Central Asia where things were happening. Ideologies yeah, yeah. were developing. Ideas were coming and ideas would go from Kashmir. And as was mentioned about Buddhism, we know it for certain in stock terms, not only from Kashmir and from Tibetan annals, from Chinese and from Selenist Buddhist annals, how important Kashmir has been. There's no need to overemphasize it here. The fact remains that part of Kashmir, having been on the crossroads, therefore a melting pot, therefore a radiating place for philosophies and ideas is there. But the questions about Christianity, I am afraid there's not much of evidence. Because, beyond uh, legends. Beyond legends. How much we need to know about these areas as well. Yeah, that is true. Uh, you know, uh, Ajmal, uh, this is a question that is close to your heart. I know Anita Dubey asked, how are the petroglyphs and the pictographs being taken care of? I've heard horrible stories, Ajmal, of the roadways blasting through large uh, bodhisattva petroglyphs in, uh, in uh, the dark and lay area. Uh, but you've done some work on the Zanskar area, the petroglyphs. What is the status? The work, when, when we started work in Zanskar, there were some areas in Zanskar which were not documented. So we documented that. But quite often you see in social media and other places, you know, people discovering and, you know, they are, you know, uh, uh, building roads and all that. That happened particularly in Zanskar, I guess. Re quite recently, somebody sent me a picture from there. And the whole you know, site was destroyed the, because of the road was uh, leveled and the uh, boulders on which this uh, petroglyphs were you know, drawn. So everything has gone now. So the, these things are particularly, petroglyphs are mostly found in Ladakh region and adjacent area from you know, Zojila onwards, Kargil and other areas. So this has to be looked upon because uh, now the, it's a separate UT so there has to be some, you know, people who can really, you know, try to safeguard that particular heritage. And it has got a very interesting relation with the Central Asian because that was the part which connected Kashmir to Central Asia also. So in between the, all these things where, you know, drawn the evidences we have from Central Asian types, the animal style of the petroglyphs, we find in Zanskar region, we find in very remote areas of Ladakh also, and that's very important. So basically this whole idea of, you know, documenting uh, this whole, uh, uh, this, this petroglyphs were, was taken up by the uh, foreign university, one of the foreign university in France, and they have, they have documented, and it's coming up online, I guess, within one year or so. It's a huge, huge project. Some, I heard some 12 lakh petroglyphs are being documented and put online. So, but that's not it. And the, there are discoveries happening quite continuously in uh, Ladakh region. So that has to be taken care of and well documented. Irfan Kadri Begsab asks a question, any Sufi culture museum in Kashmir, because Kashmir is also known as a great Sufi center you have uh, got, I think, one khanka over there restored. Uh, I think you were uh, spearheading that. Uh, but what do we know of the Sufi 
part of Kashmir. Is there anything being done to promote it? Yeah, the material part is the Sufi shrines. So I'm very happy about it. The architectural features of Sufi shrines, which are really vernacular, and as I explained during the program, they are in a proper form and a particular shape, which depicts the Sufi philosophy, which is an inclusive kind of a philosophy. That is one part. The other part is non-material, which is intangible. Well, I'm not saying that we are at a place where we were, say, 100 years back, but happily, the Sufi thought, the mystic thought, the inclusive thought, the inclusive philosophy of religious practices still prevails in Kashmir. And we have these melas, ors, and everything which is celebrated. That is what the intangible heritage of Sufism is. That's still being celebrated. Question also, you know, it's a it's a it's a question I often think of because Kashmir is also fractured, right? Because of uh, of the line of control, it's been so such a conflict zone. You have some great monuments on the other side, Ajmal. You have the great Sharda Peter, which is really one of the great temples of the period. The Gurmukhi script comes from the Sharda script, and we've done a story on that. Is there any cross border kind of connection? Any? dialogue that's happening on some of these sites? Do we even know what is happening in these sites? Uh, because it is such an inimical part of, of the heritage of, of the area. It has to be. I guess in coming years, it has to be because there is a lot of, as you said, a lot of heritage is on the other side of the border and which is well connected in the historic past. So that has to be researched and there has to be a connection. But I would I would pass on this question to Mr. Salim Begsa because he's very well, you know, he can quite rightly, he's the right person to answer this. I'm going to ask Begsa this question also, Begsa. Yeah, but for the simple reason that we, I have some linkages with two universities in Pakistan. One is Muzaffarabad University, which has been working on this subject. The other is Asian Institute of Textile Studies which is Islamabad Central University. A lot of work has been done. You know what that area is? That area is basically a transit area or a passage to Kashmir or from Kashmir towards Taxila. So on the route, there's so much of archaeology and they have a couple of PhDs now, at least two PhDs which I know where these artifacts, this archaeology has been documented. Not much of excavation has taken place, but surface archaeology has been done. And I'm happy to tell you there's a lot of interest on the other side. Unfortunately, this LOC has really put a stop to everything. Things were sh really showing up a couple of years back when this LOC opened and we had thought of trade. I have talked to scholars both in Azad Kashmir, the, uh, the Pakistan part of side of Kashmir and the, Islam, the archaeological departments in Pakistan. And there's a lot of interest in what is happening on Azad, but there's a lot of opacity because of we have no linkage and no connection. And that is one part beyond the tourism. We should go into the cultural routes, which right. certainly lead to or lead from the area you have been mentioning. And this, I would only like to conclude with one remark. There's so much of interest across the board about the alcohol. They really feel a disconnect. They feel a disconnect much more than we feel about what has been lost. It's really sad. And I think, you know, the one takeaway from this, or the two takeaways I have from this conversation is one, that we really know so little about Kashmir. And the more I hear about it, the more fascinated I get about uh, Kashmir. The second is how history can be a balm. It can be a source of coming together rather than divisiveness. Uh, so I'm going to, Vicky, you have a question, uh, you have a point to make. Uh, very quickly make it, and then I have a closing uh, uh, question for all of you. No, I just wanted to add uh, my own uh, comments on the, your last question because my family itself is come, comes from that side of Kashmir and in 47 we came to so a lot of my family personal heritage lies across the border so you know there are things which we miss over there and things which they miss over here so of course this is a very uh, you know so we have to somehow you know get 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 all this heritage of Kashmir and the passage from Kashmir towards uh, uh, the plains the North Indian plains we have to get it together and of course, as big subsides, steps were being taken a few years back, but now we all know where we stand. So, yeah. So, Ajman, I'm going to start uh, with you for the wrap-up question. My wrap-up question is, it, it is a takeoff from one of the questions I've got, which is, how can you get local villagers, local people in Kashmir more excited about their heritage, more connected? We, we, we cited that as an issue when we were talking about Burza home. We cited it as an issue when we talked about Parihaspura. 
because at the end of the day, with such a lot of heritage scattered, it is the local communities that have to take ownership and understand the value of it. That's one part of the question. Apart from that, I want your comment on this. What is the one thing that you would like to see uh, to make that change start in Kashmir overall to get heritage back in order? The first of part of the question is like, what should be done with the villagers and the people in large is that awareness, awareness and awareness. The government is not doing much. That's a problem. The state archaeology department has to do, has to aware the people about the sites, about the heritage, about the identity, their culture, their own culture. When we go to the people, tell them this is this and this is that, people don't know. I mean, being experts in the field, we have to reach to the common masses. So this will generate, there are no, there are NGOs, a lot of NGOs are working on uh, in Kashmir, but this uh, heritage part is missing. Apart from Intac and I guess there is no other NGO which is working on uh, heritage part of the Kashmir. So awareness is the most important thing. And we have been doing uh, radio talks. We have been doing TV shows quite uh, from last two, three years to make people aware. And there is a good response. But still, around the heritage sites, there has to be mo much more awareness so that people do, do not, you know, enter to the, you know, protected sites and monuments. The second part of it was, you know, what has to be done immediately is that the laws has to be enforced, in, implemented particularly. So there are laws, but those are like on paper only, and they, they, are, they are not being implemented. And, and to do one more important thing is, to bring forth new facts about the archaeology of Kashmir. That is the part of research, more and more research in the field. So that was the mandate of the archivist department a long back. But the part of research wing of the department is gone now. I I, I was uh, I heard sir, that a couple of years back, a couple of decades back, in fact, there was a research wing attached to the archaeology department of state. But that's gone now. So more and more research into the field is the only answer to these questions. Bakes up. Yep. The, the same, same question. question to you. Same question to you. How can we get the locals uh, uh, excited? What are you doing now through Intact to do that? Second, what needs to be done right away? Well, so far as monuments are concerned, not just the Kashmir, I have a pan India view of the monument because I have formerly worked in this area on this very subject. Unfortunately, there are situations where monuments have come in conflict with the people who live near the monument, the neighbors, for different reasons, for regulatory laws, for certain inconvenience, because that is something which needs to be sorted out. These are all structured things, a passage, a house, parking space, playing space, things like that. That is one part. But overall, as a community, we must realize that you have been mentioning this word, I've been liking this idiom of balm of history. How can we use culture as a balm? And this is something which is accepted universally that culture is a root which can pacify all these negative tendencies and bring about positivity among the people, not just about the monuments or about the archaeology, about everything which is good and which is precious and which is required for the society. So we must use the root of culture through awareness, through education, through interest, through debates, through programs like this. I mean, everybody is responsibility. Everybody is responsible. I know I give a lot of credit to you that you've thought of a subject like this, but one would have thought that such debates about Kashmir should be all over, or at least many times over, but that's not happening. We are at a place where it's always something negative or something unpleasant which is being radiated outside Kashmir. So that is the tragedy, and that has, that has a rebound also to the local communities. That's thank you. Thank you so much, Beksa. But we are committed to this because we've done some fabulous stories. Uh, our research team, uh, Prashant over here, and we hope to get you and Ajmal also to help tell the story of Kashmir because I think it's the more you learn about it, as I said, the more amazed you are at the at the fantastic stories that you can get from Kashmir. Uh, Kiki, uh, uh, by the way, Prashant is called Kiki, so that's why we all referring to him as Kiki. <laughs> Prashant, uh, what do you think needs to be done? How can we get the locals excited about it? See, I think first, as uh, Bakes have said and Ajmal Sahib also said, we need to make the people aware. Awareness is the key to you know everything, and get people interested in uh, their own heritage, in their own culture, 
and uh, you know people should understand that religion is a layer over our uh, culture and heritage so there can be many layers over it but but the, the the core heritage and the culture stays the same of course the layers affect it so this is something which the people have to be taught and you know we have to have interest like through social media create interest like you been uh, i've been writing for you and i've been writing independently also showcasing many historical sites and and not only the heritage site the story connected to the site you know the story is very important it's not just the 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 archaeological or the historical thing the how how it is connected with the culture of the people and then uh, of course we have to promote a uh, 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 a museum going culture where you know you go to a museum in kashmir and there hardly anybody there and of course all this photography thing and all this there and then we have to probably set up small museums at the more important historical sites you know which gets which uh, uh, then people get more excited more involved then probably they would visit the sps museum and uh, you know once they visit the museum and when they see the whole lot of uh, things they have on display they'll get interested in other sites like burj al hamam and uh, all those sites like when they see the harvan tiles they would be uh, you know curious to see where it came from and so i i think this museum and whole connecting the people with their culture and their heritage is very important for uh, this to go uh, the role of the new generation that they don't get uh, only the negative of of the conflict of uh, of of the way the life has been affected but also the positive of what the heritage is what the cultural legacy is of kashmir is very important and that's where uh, ajmal your role uh, you know the role that intact plays in trying to get communities involved is so so important and kiki your role also of actually telling the stories from there uh, gentlemen i've really enjoyed this discussion thank you so much for joining us today and thank you our viewers for staying with us i'm sorry about the various issues we had uh, i do hope that you enjoy this discussion and we promise to get you a lot more on kashmir thank you so much Thank you.